Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Target. I am one of the graduate assistants in the Office of Gift Planning, and I have with us today Mr. Charles Roblowski. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so this is going to be one of our donor story series interviews. And um, I was hoping you can kind of just start with an introduction and um, let everyone know a little bit about yourself and who you are. OK, I graduated from undergraduate from St. John's College in 1963 and from the law school in 66. Awesome. And then immediately after the following uh, September, I was drafted into the US Army. And I spent two years in the Army, one year down at Fort Gordon and one year in the Republic of Korea during the Viet Vietnam conflict. Mm -hmm. When I returned to the States, uh, a lot of the jobs had been taken already by someone else or there weren't many opportunities. And a friend of my father said, well, why don't you apply for the FBI? And I didn't know what he, the FBI even did, but I applied. So, so in late June of 1969, I entered the bureau, and uh, immediately after graduation from a new agents class, I was assigned to Louisville Division, actually in Louisville itself, and then Covington, Kentucky, which is across the river from Cincinnati. And I spent one year there, as it was the practice at that time, and then seven years in the Chicago office, handling all different kinds of cases. And I was a uh, relief supervisor, and then I was the night supervisor from four to midnight. And I had gone back to a legal in service at Quantico, and I had indicated that I would like to come back to the East Coast. And so, uh, as night supervisor, I was on for about maybe two months, three months, and then I got the call that I was going back to headquarters. And I served for three years in uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Privacy section. It was just opening up at that time, and it was a brand new ball field. And it was really comfortable being there because we had maybe 16 agents. Mm -hmm. And out of the 16, the strange thing was four of them, we graduated from St. John's Law School, the same class. Wow. And yes. So, so after that, after having my three years there, as there was the policy, they had a thing that and I'll, I'll get around a little saying, it's called the gong show, where three older agents interview you and decided what was going to happen to you. I don't know if you ever watched the TV show, The Gong Show, where they used to, people used to get up and do acts and then hit, hit, hit a thing and that would put you off the stage. So anyway, they decided that I'd be sent to Baltimore Division. So I was sent up to Baltimore, which handles the states of, uh, of Maryland and Delaware. And I was there for five years as a supervisor for kidnapping, bank robbery, extortion, fugitive, and white collar crime. And then I was called back to headquarters and asked if I would take over hiring at FBI. So I did the hiring for the FBI. That's for field officers, for agents, for clerks. And I did that uh, up until almost the end of my uh, career. At the end of my career, we had a hiring freeze and there was nothing to do in hiring. Uh, one of those, so I went back to FOI, retired in 1993 and uh, stayed in DC area, Northern Virginia. And returned to New York in 2005. I'm actually back in the same house as when I made my first communion from, and we moved here in 1948. So, and I try to be as active as I can in the community and active with St. John's, which really I I really hold this university a special place in my my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like one amazing career and one amazing life story. So, thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Um, so. I want to kind of go back to the beginning. When you were at St. John's, um, what was your, what were you studying for your undergrad? History. History. And, yeah, then... and of course, history. And of course, at that time, you automatically had, an, had a minor in philosophy and three credits short of a minor in theology at that time. So, so, did, so did you get both those minors? No, just philosophy. Just philosophy. Yeah. So. And then, so you graduated in 63. And then you went immediately to the law school? Right there, yeah. And that time the law school was located in Brooklyn. Okay. It was not on the campus at that time. So, yeah. so, so when you've, you've graduated then from the law school and how, and I'm not really too aware of this, but how, how did the, um, like the recruiting for the, the army work? Well, because the draft was in existence. The draft. And my so draft number, I had postponed it for the three years while you were in law school mm -hmm. as a student deferment. So I graduated in June, I think in July, I had my notice to go for my physical. And in August I had notice was, come down where you're going away, boy. <laughs> so that's what happened. Yeah, and so yeah. then you, uh, so you went 
and you were deployed in Korea? Eventually, I, I went to Korea. First, first I was in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Fort Gordon, and I did not become an officer. Uh, they had offered me that, but I didn't want to stay in for the extra years. Mm -hmm. And the staff judge advocate there said to me, good, we'll take care of you. And he really did, because the day I graduated from uh, uh, basic training, I was assigned to his office working. And so I did things like wills. I was basically almost like a legal assistant, legal clerk at that time, because I wasn't an officer. And then I got traded off by him to another full bird colonel to handle uh, another unit, a, an advanced unit. And at the end when the, of my one year, it came orders for Korea. I actually thought I was going to Vietnam when I saw the APO number. That's the mm -hmm. address 960. Yeah, but so, and, uh, and that was, a uh, career was a very exciting thing. And, and uh, this was my sabbatical, okay? Something that I never had time to relax. In Korea, was, I was assigned to headquarters I-Corps. And that's halfway between Seoul and the DMZ. And uh, full bird colonel was there. Almost everybody on that base had, had a college diploma, college degree, or above. So because we all worked in, in various offices. And the interesting thing is the patch that I wore on my arm, on my sleeve, is actually the patch that you see on the MASH unit. The MASH unit? On TV, on TV. Oh. oh. MASH, the TV show, that's the same group there. Okay. And so, yeah. And uh, to divert a little bit, I'll tell you about a story about a St. John's fellow, okay? Love it. Uh, Love it. it was, Tony Franzese and I were very good friends in undergraduate and in law school. He went, at that time, the, the pharmacy school was four years, and he was going for a pharmacy undergraduate degree, and I went for history. We went to law, law school, and then we lost track at one year in between. Well, I get to Korea, and I go to uh, Catholic, Catholic Relief School at dinners, for, and we went down, I went down to Seoul, and there he was. And uh, he had actually, what is, he was an ROTC, so he was in as a captain. And he was actually a captain of that MASH unit. And we used to meet in Seoul once a month. We'd go out for dinner and then we'd ride home in his ambulance. He'd drop me off and then go further north. So, and our friendship has remained over all these years. So, and that's mm -hmm. one thing I'm going to say about St. John's. Friendships from St. John's are special and you continue them over the years. It may have been a commuter school before they had the dorms, but there is something special about St. John's individuals. So, right. And I, I feel the same way. And I was telling this to Miss um, Elizabeth DeFeese, who I who I got to speak with the other day, who was also a McAllen Society member. And I was mm -hmm. telling her, like, I just feel like I'm going to keep these relationships that I've developed here at St. John's with many of my friends for a lifetime. And I, and I really feel that. Well, when I got back to D.C., it was interesting because there they had a very active chapter. Uh, and they had, I, I think I had told you before uh, when we had spoken, the insider's view, which they still have. And I was active in that for many years. That's when we used to bring down 35 juniors and they would actually live with us at that time. And I would handle the housing and also go around with them for a three or four day session. Everything was on Capitol Hill. And what we do is we'd run different, different small groups. Like we'd have a group of, uh, I handled the one with law enforcement, so I would handle that. But then we also had St. John's graduates who were in uh, Secret Service and all different branches of that. We had military. We even have a full bird colonel who was the staff judge advocate for the Marine Corps and a civilian staff judge advocate for the Marine Corps who were St. John's Law School graduates. And they would conduct one, one session along with some Marines who were St. John's. Then we'd also do a uh, political, and the head of the political group was actually a young man uh, and who was, uh, who up until just recently was the chief of staff for uh, Peter King here in New York. Wow. And, and so, yeah, and, and it was just all the, and, we, and of course it was since it was a commuter school and we had, we did not have uh, uh, dorms when the young men and young women came down it was the first time they actually could go out and party and have a great time. and. I, it was it was a bonding. Uh, I actually have a young man here uh, in a pharmacy here who was one of the 20, 30 years ago, was one of those participants. And, and that group, a lot of us still keep in touch with each other. 
So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, so you you said you spent about a year in Korea before right. before you came back to the United States. Right. Um, and then you ended up in the FBI, where you happened to be with uh, three other or four other St. John's Law alum. Three, right? three at that time. Yeah. Now, yes. did you did you know these uh, people while you were at the law school, or was it just a coincidence? Yes, Are yes, you... they were in my classes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that so, must have been uh, fun working with fellow classmates in the FBI. It was. It was because you, you had you had a common idea and you came from common backgrounds. So, and you know, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, as a matter of fact, one, I really didn't know that well. And while I was in new agents training, I walked into the elevator and he was there because he had gone in the, in the FBI right after law school and he didn't know who I was. And I said hello to him and then we, we renewed our friendship. But then I was assigned with him later on. And uh, so, because at that time, he said the FBI Academy was three weeks in Quantico in a building, not like it is now. The other weeks were actually in the old post office, which is now Trump's hotel. Oh. That's, that, yes, so it was interesting, yeah. And the experience of, of going different places, I think serves you well, so. Yes, yeah. and, and I know, and that's something I wanted to, uh, to hopefully accomplish in the next couple of years is like you just said, going to all these different places uh, serve, serves you well. So I'm hoping I can do some traveling myself. Um, so you were, you were working at Quantico, the, the FBI headquarters? No, no, no. Oh. When I went with FBI headquarters, when I got back to FBI, but my two tours were actually right there in Pennsylvania area in the J. Edgar Hoover building. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so I was hoping, I mean, the FBI, it's, it's a, seems like a very cool job. I was wondering, and I don't know how much you can tell because I don't know what the, the details are like with the FBI, but. Um, if you could share anything about uh, like the kind of work that you were doing, I, I would love to hear that. Well, I, I actually, because of, of the different places I work, I did a variety of cases. Okay. Uh, uh, when I was in Baltimore, the most of them were the white collar crime accounting squad, you know, even though it wasn't accounting. So you actually had all the fraud cases, et cetera, but you also had agents on your squad who were undercover. And uh, uh, they were undercover, and you'd be doing the accounting part of the undercover. Uh, you met all different kinds of people. You were involved with local police forces, other federal agencies. And uh, in Chicago, it was a combination of fugitives. It was a combination of embezzlement. A lot in Baltimore, a lot of bank robberies and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, and in, in the FBI, you could be working on one squad, and if another squad needs help, you're out. I mean, I mean, I. I can remember in Baltimore being called out at one o'clock in the morning uh, for an arrest. And, and my theory was if the squad was going out, I was the supervisor, I wanted to go with them. So uh, I don't know if this is appropriate for this, but at one o'clock in the morning, we actually had to go to a strip joint. And it was uh, quite an experience. It was uh, interesting. And I've been on gambling raids where we uh, traveled from Chicago over to Detroit and they were like massive, massive hundreds of people were arrested mm -hmm. and stuff. It's no day. I think what I like best about the job is even if when I was at on the desk, any day you went in, it was not you were not going to do what you thought you were going to do. Mm -hmm. you know? And so and in charge of hiring was exceptional. I mean, the people I met, the quality of the people at headquarters and the applicants, we actually started the honors intern program where we brought outsiders in to from college to try to get them. Uh, and that was Judge Webster's idea, I believe, to have them go back and kind of be part, I'm going to use a word, a mole in the college to get other people to come. So there were our recruiters, and I won't mention the name, but two of them are presently on TV, on the, on the, on the channels, the, the, the experts who speak. Yeah. And it's really neat. It really is neat. Uh, I, that's when I say, wow. And, and uh, uh, I'm actually in touch with them. So that's nice. So. Yeah. So, so when you were uh, working and hiring for the FBI, yes. um, did you uh, find many St. John students were trying to come to the FBI? I did a survey once, okay? Mm -hmm. And the survey was, believe it or not, there were more FBI 
people in the Bureau than any other college in the United States. Really? Yeah. But it changed. And it changed when the University of Maryland started to have all these campuses all over the world at different army bases. Then it split. And when you went to virtual learning, that's when it changed. Because originally it had to be an accredited four-year college. But yes, a lot. Yeah. And you know, it's also because as a St. John students, uh, a lot of their parents are are of a of a first generation, and law enforcement is is something that they they kind of hold very dear to them because that protects their liberties. Mm-hmm. At least mm-hmm. I still think and hope everybody believes that way. So. Awesome. Um, so it, it sounds like you you had an uh, amazing career with the FBI. Um, so uh, you retired from the FBI in 1993. Right. Um, what did you go on to, to do after uh, the FBI? Uh, I was active in a homeowners association in Virginia. I also was appointed by uh, Jerry Connolly, who is a, a representative now for the state of Virginia. He was the chairman of Fairfax County. And I got appointed to the Historical Society down there. And I was actually chairman for a number of years, which a boy from New York. And uh, another sideline, which is funny, I just by different DNA and different things. I found out my great, great grandfather who came from Ireland, uh, James Charles Curran, because I'm always German and Irish, all beer drinkers, okay? He came to Williamsburg, Brooklyn in 1845 and he died at the age of 100 in 1921. He actually served in the Union Army and it looks like he may have served in Northern Virginia in the Union Army. And there I was in Southern territory, not knowing that one of my relatives had actually been there. That's the neat thing about about life. What yeah. You find out, right. Yeah, yeah. I, and I definitely need to do uh, one of those DNA tests to to maybe have one of those aha moments like you did. Well, you, you need to do it because also you find out you find out more about yourself than others. I mean, uh, I've actually found family who they didn't even know that they that they were that they had other family. I mean, mm-hmm. on my dad's side. So yes, yeah. Awesome. Well. Your career sounds amazing, and I kind of wanted to to bring it back to to St. John's now. Um, so, so you're a, a member of the McCallum Society. Um, right. Can you kind of talk me through like your rationale for or what made you want to become a member of the McCallum Society? I started first with the Laughlin Society. Okay. Okay, and then I learned more and more through Susan Damiani, and then Claire McKeever is also a friend of mine from having come down to D.C. and stuff. And I think the reason why, well, I know the reason why. The reason why is because I saw with the students and with my fellow alumni, what St. John's does with what you give them. And I, the Vincentian idea of, you know, giving back, uh, I always laugh because when somebody says to me about the Vincentians and St. John's, I say, well, I was baptized by a Polish Vincentian in Greenpoint, Brooklyn and went to kindergarten and first grade at St. Stan. So maybe that started my career. But, I, but I've always been one that wanted to give back. Uh, I think, you know, the old saying of, of to, to, to those that are given a lot, of just give back a lot. I think that's, that's, what, that's what you judge by or you should judge yourself by. I mean, you, everybody should be a mentor for somebody else. And this allows people who wouldn't be able to probably go to college or enjoy things to actually Get, get involved. Uh, I mean, it's money well spent. Plus I have I have this strange little idea that I'd like to see what I'm done with my money now, not after I'm gone. Mm-hmm. So, and it serves well. I mean, hey, it's it's a, it's a it's paying forward. That's what it is. Right. And, and it, it's a fantastic society. I mean, you know, I mean, just, uh, and uh, you know, Susan Damiani, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Susan and I have, have kidded about, uh, we actually, and I don't know if Susan will tell you this, and I guess I could say you can cut it out if you don't want to, but we went out with the Alumni Association out to uh, the Sparkling Point Winery on, and uh, the, the owner of Sparkling Point came out while we were out there, uh, okay? And uh, Tom Rosicki, and he's an attorney, and he and his wife. Tom was actually, when he was in the FBI, on my squad in Baltimore. Wow. And he came out. And he greeted us all on the back patio and he uh, took us on a personal tour. And then uh, I believe at the end said to Susan, uh, this is on me. Uh, you know, so again, it's at St. John's. 
St. John's people take care of St. John's people. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Uh, well, uh, and unfortunately, right now with this pandemic, I'm not sure how you, you you're not having the true interreaction. Your 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 idea or your exposure to mixture, and we are. I am too. I miss going out the Lions Club dinners and everything. I mean, it's just. But I think it's going to be over soon, and I think it's going to make us appreciate it more. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like you mentioned, we we haven't had that interaction that I think the McAllen Society usually has with its members. Um, and that's why we've been trying to do like interviews like this so that we can still have that that like McAllen spirit and, and hear from people like you who, who care so much about not only the society, but the university. Um, well, and yeah. And also when, when you're with alumni, you who have been successful and, you know, and even it, it's something it's something that that makes you proud. Uh, I mean, and 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 I had the opportunity to meet some really fantastic people. I mean, one of my favorites, is, 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 I mean, is is uh, Father Tracy, Bernard Tracy, because mm -hmm. he would come down sometimes and have dinner with us with the St. John's group. And uh, you know, I saw the priest from St. John's when we had we had an individual who helped find the found the alumni group in D.C. and he was in the first graduating class from the law school when he passed away. A priest from St. John's came down to to be on to the funeral at St. Matthew's Cathedral, and that you know you take care of your own, and right. that's that's what McCallum Society is. You're taking care of your own. Mm -hmm. It's an outreach program. Yes, I love that. Yeah. Um, so I mean, you, you brought up Susan, and and Susan is is wonderful. She's the director of the McCallum Society now. For anyone who may or may not know. Um, she she uh, wanted me to to kind of bring a point up, and I was like a bit of a challenge to you. Uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> so if, if you were uh, in a room or having dinner with someone who was maybe on the fence of, should I become a McAllen Society member? Or I don't know, which, like, should I do it? Um, how, how would you uh, go about convincing them to, to make the leap and become a part of this McAllen Society? Well, I... My friends all kid me because the first thing I do is I conduct an interview and find out everything about you and find out what we have in common. Mm -hmm. Then when I find out what's in common, then you 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 add on to that. And I, I think it would be a, a situation of, a, a, hey, this is what I've seen. This is what I know. I mean, just meeting like you, for example, and everybody else. We have a young man here who graduated from Seaford High School, and uh, he just graduated from St. John's and uh, he uh, is going into law enforcement and, and and I really like to see that career. And then there's other ones. And you, I even carried into my high school, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, know, you get them young enough. That's good. And, and I think that's what you have to do. And you, you have to, there are people who sometimes are skeptical, you know, and, and not everybody can afford or do something, but it is is something good. Plus, you know, hey, uh, it's a good tax write-off. I mean, I'm kidding with you, but it is. I just delivered my my taxes. Uh, you know, there are some there are great benefits for it. I mean, and again, you get a return, and and it's there. It's it's helping others while you're helping yourself. So, right. right, and that at the end of the day is the essence of the McAllen Society. Um, so I, I know you mentioned uh, that great story of. Um, when you were out at the winery and uh, you ran into an acquaintance who took you guys on a tour of the of, of the winery and the restaurant. Um, I was, so obviously right now we're in the pandemic and we can't have these wonderful in-person events that I've heard so much about. Um, I was wondering if you maybe have a, a favorite McAllen Society event over the years that you would you would wanna share? If, if you could pick one, and it was probably there, tough. There's, there's so many. Uh, you know, and I'm not sure it would, uh, the, some of the different things on the lawn that they've had, that wasn't really McAllen, but a lot of McAllen people were there where we had a barbecue one time outside mm -hmm. one night and, and a concert. And, and uh, I remember uh, there was a uh, one fellow who owned a winery, one who owned a beer, uh, a brewery. So that was pleasant. And, and, you know, I mean, and if you bring your friends to those and then you expose them, but I think every single event I've been to, I mean, 
whether it was out at the racetrack, that was what the fun, we went out for an afternoon at the racetrack. And yeah, I, and anything that, Susan does a fantastic job. I mean, she she puts her whole heart into it. And I think that's what, I think everybody in the McCallum Society, it's almost like a, a brotherhood and sisterhood. It really is like an alumni association of caring people. And that's what I would say it would be. I mean, uh, and, and I'm sure you've got schools, you know, for example, you have Chaminade High School here with a great, I mean, the, the scholarships because people give so, so much back. Well, in your own small way, you're doing this for St. John's. And right. hey, it, 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 is one of the, it is one of the best. I mean, you know, we're proud, you know I mean? It, it, and you, we should be. Look at all we've accomplished. I mean, uh, just when I was in DC, I remember what were there, two or three sitting governors that one was in the Virgin Islands, one was, I guess, in New York, and I forgot where the other one was, that were St. John's graduates at one time. It's, St. John's is now international. It's no longer the parochial, which is one of the, the dorms are fantastic. That idea of the dorms, I think, is great. And I told you, I think uh, it actually it was raised at a, uh, an alumni function in DC. And we said, hey, you know, Who's going to send the kids back to St. John's if they have to live in Jamaica Estates or whatever? But if you can send them on the dorms, and you know, if you go to the dorms for one year, you might meet somebody and then you all move off. So it's a constant flow in and out. Right. And, and the dorms are like the army or military service when you have to live with people. And especially, you know, I mean, if you were an only child or the only boy and now you're with a bunch of other guys and girls and stuff, I mean, it really, and, and that's part of learning what life's about learning how to deal with different people because an education is nothing unless you use it to to know how to to mix with people that's the if you're not a mixer i mean there are those great people who can sit in a room and do research but that you want people also out there talking yes right see i sound like um, a new yorker back i got my talking it sounds like a new yorker i put it back go ahead Perfect. Well, I mean, this this was uh, this was fantastic. I, I loved hearing all about your your career with the FBI, um, your, your time as a McAllen Society member, and um, I'm sure that everyone in the McAllen Society is looking forward to hopefully this pandemic being over sooner than later, so that we can return to some of these in person events that you just shared with us that are uh, really so special. So. Um, and thank you for, for the pieces of advice for whether McAllen Society members want to take them in, but I know I'm definitely going to take them in. Um, so just uh, thank you again for being here today. And I know whoever's listening to this will enjoy the conversation. Well, and I thank you and, and keep in touch, please. And if, if, if I ever can do anything for you, or if I have somebody else that I know can do something for you or any student, uh, I, I did go back one time, actually I was called back to talk to the criminal justice uh, club one afternoon I was invited, which is interesting. I mean, you know, is the old expression when the rubber hits the road, it's a different than teaching in a classroom. So, mm -hmm. so uh, please, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Keep in touch. Of course. Okay. Thank you.